I, I think that generally speaking, it's a dangerous thing to be too convinced you're on the side of virtue. And that's difficult because, of course, a lot of good things in the world have been done by people who have a very strong moral vision about making the world a better place. So this is actually quite difficult. But I think what tends to happen here is that the people who have that sense of virtue and goodness in the right way don't tend to be ideological. In case you say uh, anything of interest, uh, which, which yeah. might it might just happen. <laughs> it's always conceivable. <laughs> I'm recording. I, I looked at. I was just looking at my face for a while while waiting. It was a weird. I sort of got in sort of a bit of a trance, and I was just like looking at my face. I don't look at my face that much, and it was like, oh, look at that, and I sort of fell into a bit of a, tr- a stupor. Really, that's, that's that's interesting. I ought to try mm. that one day. I yeah. tend to like try and look away if at all possible if I find myself. <laughs> Looking at myself, I never watch myself. Never watch my own videos or listen to my own podcasts or anything. So I'm sorry, I won't listen to this. Please don't. Please don't. Um, <laughs> are you able to record anything on your on your side? Don't worry if not. Yeah, I can. Oh, look at that! Oh, you got a whole posh thing there. Yeah, it's a zoom. It's very good. But I'll tell you what. I'll also. I mean, belt braces. And what's the third thing you can use? Hmm. Um, I'll do the other thing. <laughs> Is that, belt, is that belt a, braces uh, and what well, is the third thing? There must be something else to keep your trousers up. A, a bit of string, a bit of string around you. Around, right. Okay. So I've also got my phone doing it as well. So basically, there's no way we're not going to get audio. That Zoom. I'm excited about that now. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Maybe it's too yeah. sensitive. Maybe it'll be all sorts of ambient noise. I hope not. Between the three recordings, it's probably going to be fine, isn't it? One will be fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so how's your day going? Thanks for joining me on this. No, no, thank you for having me. My day is um, uh, basically it's evidence that I'm some kind of a fraud or imposter in the sense that, you know, uh, I write about philosophy and everything. So you would have thought I lived the life of the mind. (laughs) Ha 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 ha. At the moment, we we moved house earlier this year and my life has been so not of the mind. It's ridiculous. It's been all to do with just mundane matters around... uh, you know, flat pack furniture and kitchens. Um, so, but I think one should be honest about this kind of thing, to be honest. You know, I think that uh, there's a lot of dishonesty amongst people involved in intellectual work. It's like they, they maintain the pretense that they don't worry about other things. There was a wonderful example of this many years ago when The Guardian were sponsoring the Hay Festival. They did this thing where they went around and randomly stopped, you know, writers. And said, what are you thinking about right now? This is the, what are you about right now? Now, if you think about that, the odds are that at least half of them would have been said something like, I'm thinking about my lunch or I'm thinking about how annoying the last person was or I'm, or I'm worried about my sales. Yeah. And all of them came back to me, I'm thinking about, you know, the state of peace in the Middle East or I'm thinking <laughs> about... And I thought, this is just not honest. And only one person was honest, the, the wonderful Joan Bakewell, who is a, is a national treasure. She said something like, I'm not thinking of anything right now because, frankly, you know, my brain is all frazzled and, and I've just, you know... I'm only really thinking of where I can get my next cup of tea. I think that was the only honest answer in the whole thing. Everyone else goes through this pretense of, I'm I'm only ever thinking of intellectual matters. They never go to Ikea. (laughs) They don't go to Ikea. (laughs) The concept of of somebody being a philosopher is, to the rest of us, it's almost so foreign that we do like to believe that you are sitting there, sort of that uh, Rodin sculpture with a fist on your chin, uh, thinking intellectual thoughts. But of course, that's that's a great look for anyone listening. Uh, Julian's doing it now. But yeah. the, the, <laughs> the the lovely pose. But I mean, the, 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 I was thinking of the, the John Lennon quote, you know, life is what's, what happens when you're making other plans or whatever. That I mean, that's mm. that's philosophy, isn't it, in a sense? And, and I suppose the mundane is life. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've kind of went in my sort of professional career, as it were, I've, I've always like to sort of like blur those distinctions and cross those lines between the mundane and the and the the abstract and i think that you know life is lived on the day to day it's like ethics for example when you do an ethics course typically it used to be the case that you would do things like you know abortion euthanasia and uh what's the other big one they always did animal rights you know these are the big things Mm. and well actually apart from animal rights the other two are things which Actually, most people, well, no, well, abortion, a large proportion, but still most people probably don't have to make a decision on that, especially given that um, half the population is male and don't make the decision on abortion themselves. Um, you know, 
But day to day, we do things like, you know, we, we, we go shopping and we buy things which are either putting the money into the hands of certain people or not other people. We have these little daily interactions, how you how you deal with your neighbours and so forth. And and the idea that these things aren't important, I think, is, is, is just obviously false. You know, if I get... Murder is really obviously morally wrong, but most people don't go through their lives murdering. But no. what kind of levels of decency and, and moral standards do you have in your everyday life? So I, I think the, the everyday is very important and is often um, neglected. Uh, in terms of having those standards in your everyday life, that's one of the things I think that frustrates me the most about people because uh, I think that I have really quite selfish thoughts a lot of the time and I think everybody else does as well mm. and that we're not honest about it. Where do you stand on that? Oh, well, absolutely we do. I think most of the time we're, we're, we're caught up in our... <laughs> Selfish concerns, absolutely. I think it, no, people don't tend to think they're selfish, obviously. Um, a lot of selfishness sort of goes under the radar and it's just to do with uh, cognitive biases, right? You know, we just, without even noticing, we're looking at the world from a rather egocentric point of view. So, for example, the fact that yeah, when people get really cross and angry about other people being late or, you know, yeah, we, we notice other people's bad behavior very, very easily and are often very, very judgmental about it. And we don't really notice our own. Yeah. Mm. And, and, and we, I don't know. I mean, I, I hope, I don't think I'm a obnoxious person. I hope not. But, no. Um, you know, am I, I'm probably less reliable than I should be. Actually, I say that. I think since, since this whole pandemic thing, I've become less reliable. I think I used to be quite reliable. I think I've become really unreliable. I keep missing meetings and things. Um, mm. I don't think I, you know, the thing is, in your own case, you don't think about what you don't do. I'm, I know I'm not a big liar. I know I'm not a big deceiver and all that kind of stuff. But I also know that I, I, I live my life in a fairly selfish way, to be honest. I mean, you know, I don't, I, I've done very little kind of volunteering and stuff in my life. And I say it's because I don't have the time. I'm too busy doing other things. And, you know, um, but mm. still, I don't do it. I've got an excuse. Uh, other people are busy too. They manage to do, to do that kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, we just that's what this, the selfishness is just sort of seeing the world through a lens in which we're blind to our own faults and very very alert to those of others. And then also the, like the self-serving thing as well. You know, we often think it's a matter of fairness and justice that we get a certain good deal out of a situation. Whereas, so like when we moved house, this is a very very good example of this. I think it does bring out the worst in people. Um, but people get very very annoyed at buyers. Uh, essentially seeming to like drive a hard bargain and think they're selfish, horrible, selfish people. But actually, the most people when they're making decisions about moving house are making those sort of decisions too and would, again, you know, pay less if they could, get money off if they could. And, you know, very few people are just the uh, extremes. <laughs> but again, you get very annoyed when someone knocks you down on the price or talks you up on the price, depending on what the situation is. But if you're doing it yourself, you think, well, it's only reasonable, it's only fair. There's work to be done, you know? Of course, of course, you know. <laughs> I do that same thing with the, uh, you know, giving money to homeless people in that I don't I don't often do it. And I tell myself, well, if I gave to everyone, I'd have no money left. And it's not like I'm raking it in. So, you know, I, I'm able to convince myself of that. But in actual fact, the amount of sort of 50p's, it would add up probably to quite a negligible amount, if I'm honest with myself. It's just a way of not having to give any money yeah no i know what you mean that's a tricky one because there's, there's a genuine question about whether that's the best use of the money i mean i personally think that actually giving money directly is is not so much it probably isn't a lot of help it is true that a lot of people who are rough sleeping do have alcohol and, and drug problems and uh, the money is probably going to go on that to, to be honest and you know the people who have the sign saying i need 17 pounds for the hostel is it's generally it's a it's a, it's it's just not true because the hostels don't demand money <laughs> at entry. Uh, but but I think it's more about the humanising thing. I think when I when I'm tempted to sometimes give money or or or, or, or buy a sandwich or a cup of tea or something, it's not because I've got any illusions that's going to make a big difference to the person. It's just that I think there's something about being recognised as a human being in that situation which is important. So that's the yeah. that's the value of what I'm doing. I think. You could do that just by yeah. stopping and talking, of course, as well. But again, I'm too busy. Sorry, no time today. Yeah. Um. <laughs> but also, some of, the, some of them have cards saying, like, I need money for booze. And I think people yeah. respect the honesty. And so yeah. they would give them... Because you also think, you know what? Your, your life is so much harder than mine through luck of the draw, yeah. basically. And if 
if you want a beer and it's going to get you through the cold night, then I, even, even if I'm not helping you long term, I just sort of want to give it to them. Maybe it's not a good idea. I don't know. Anyway, but it's complicated. But the point is, whatever, whatever, the, whatever the right choice is, most of the time we don't make the decision on the basis of a of a, a fair, good moral consideration. It's the basis of you know selfishness, time, being in a hurry, whatever it might be. And that, that's just true i think unfortunately have you found that with social media is there a bit more of a need to tell oneself and to tell the world that we're good people i saw david Badil tweeted last night uh, about peep show the british sitcom um and he said he just rewatched it and how brilliant it was because of how honest they were about sort of human selfishness and what we really like and he wondered if that would still be a success today yeah no, it's a good question i think it was very funny i'm sure it'd be a success today perhaps more so because um, yeah, I mean, people, I think social media, I don't want to moan too much about social media. I do use it myself. I have a, a love-hate relationship with it. It does seem to encourage that kind of highly, what, what do you call it, highly curated self-presentation, if you like to use too many buzzwords in one in one sentence. Um, you know, with people, you, 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 again, it's not conscious or deliberate, but every time you're doing a tweet or something, uh, you're aware that this is how you're presenting yourself publicly. Now, of course, that's true in daily life as well. When you meet people, um, you know, you don't just talk as if you would if there was no one in the room. <laughs> so, yeah, there's nothing new about presenting our, the best versions of ourselves, as it were. But I think in social media, it's almost like up, ups the stakes a bit because there's a kind of a culture, which I think in Britain used to be quite alien, of, of really talking oneself up. We used to be a culture in which self-deprecation was the thing. Whereas now it's become more about, you know, self-affirmation and confidence and self-esteem. And so people are often trying to sort of like demonstrate how, I don't know, the right they're on the right side of the moral or political debate. They're generous, they're kind, they're, they're, they're successful, they've got a, a lovely, their partner is great, their pet is fantastic, and their, their dinner, even their dinner's worth taking a photo of and all that kind of thing. Um, so... Yeah, yeah, I think I think there is there's something about about that that it sort of doesn't really encourage honesty. And I think one of the weird things about this is uh, it's kind of a that's kind of taken into account because obviously it's not that social media is all about being positive. You're also encouraged to share your vulnerability. And again, this is this big thing we can we can actually date this, can't we, to that TED talk by was it Rene Brown or something, whatever it was, who did this TED talk on vulnerability, and it's sort of like it's absolutely, you know, uh, gone, gone, gone stellar and, and and gone viral, and and everyone now talks about how important it is to show your vulnerability. And in fact, if you do anything like this, if you go to any kind of master classes on podcasting or social media, it's one of the things they always tell you, you know, be vulnerable with your audience, show them your humour, because mm. uh, this is actually a good way to, to, earn, to earn trust and to bond. But I think in, in a weird way, it, it seems to be, that seems to be about authenticity and honesty, but it isn't because it becomes another performance. You know, you've got to, yeah. you've got to perform your vulnerability in the right way. You know, you're, you're not supposed to sort of go on social media and say something like, I'm feeling really crap today because actually... You know, I treated my last partner like a complete bastard and now I'm feeling sorry for myself. You know, it's always like, you know, sorry, having a hard time, folks, difficult breakup. And then everyone comes in and goes, oh, feeling sorry for you. Get better soon. It'll come out, blah, blah, blah. So there's a, I don't want to, I don't want to sort of, I think there's a benefit to this. I don't want to be too harsh on this. I, I really appreciate that sometimes it is genuinely helpful for people to open up a bit on social media and get that support. But the overall culture, I think, encourages it to become a bit too much of a performance. And, and how can you how can you do that really honestly on social media when you know your audience is so diverse? The point about opening up is you tend to open up to people you know or you trust. There's something personal about it. Yeah, opening up to the world is something that is is never going to be quite the same thing, is it? No. And and I did read something recently suggesting that I think it was an academic study suggesting that uh, people who either virtue or victim in this case victim signal are are something like thirty percent more likely to have psychopathic or narcissistic traits. <laughs> yeah, I can kind of believe that. 
Although, again, one's got to be careful interpreting that that data. Yeah. 30% more likely. So a lot of people are, are perfectly nice and normal. You know? yes. It's a bit like this thing that you know uh, CEOs are more likely to have psychopathic tendencies. That may well be true. It doesn't mean that all or most CEOs are psychopaths, which is what um, yeah. some people would like it to mean. <laughs> no, but they might be higher up on the spectrum. Yeah, but it's all on average. It's all on average, isn't it, as well? That's the thing. Uh, I, one of the sort of my bugbears about the way in which people interpret um, research in psychology and social psychology is that the findings are always, that on average, there is a certain spread of differences. Um but when you apply that to individual cases and how much you can predict what an individual person can be, often these things are not very helpful at all. And you see that particularly actually in, in people who, who like to point to evidence of differences between, you know, uh, male and female traits. They're set aside at the fact, first of all, that doesn't tell you whether they're innate or socially constructed. So that doesn't tell you that anyway. But even so, a lot of these things... I mean, for example, you know, like, let's say f- f- I play tennis badly, um, physical strength, you know, so we know that on average, uh, men are physically stronger than, than women, which is why at the elite level, um, the top men will always beat the top women. But once you get to a level like mine at a club, right, you know, knowing my opponent is, is a woman is, gives me, is almost useless in predicting the result of the match. Because, mm. you know, <laughs> the on average thing doesn't really work, uh, you know, when, 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 you're, when you're at a level where you're not at the, 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 the very top or the very bottom. Does that suggest that elite CEOs might be more likely to be psychos? I think it was, neg- <laughs> it was negligible, wasn't it? It was something like, I think 1% of the population or, or at least 1% of men are psychopaths yeah. and it was something like 2 or 3% of CEOs are, yeah. are supposed to be psychopaths. Exactly. So, you know, so like, you know, double, 100% more likely, whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, it sounds impressive, but it's still a, a, a small proportion. So you've got to take into account those baseline probabilities as they call it but i mean people do this all the time and there's there's loads of stuff where people over extrapolate and these things about statistical significance um as well you know people people mistake statistical significance for really really significant in 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 the broader sense so for example i remember somebody i know uh, ran a kind of online thing which was showing uh from a statistical point of view a very striking difference between um attitudes of male and female respondents to some kind of I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was something to do with like sexual ethics and stuff, which, you know, was taken to indicate that, you know, there's this fundamental difference between between men and women because the, the gap between uh, the male and female responses was around 13%. And given the numbers involved, that was really, really huge. Now, that looks impressive, but actually, if you break down the numbers even more, what that really means was something like, you know, 60% of men and women r- responded exactly the same way in this respect. Another kind of uh, 27% reacted exactly the same way in the other respect. And there was only 13% who responded uh, differently. So that means the vast majority of men and women actually had exactly the same views of the situation. Mm. So it, it, how you frame the, the data is really, really important. And by the way, we're talking about all this stuff. I don't, I, I don't know whether we've already gone off on a bit of a tangent. Um, what's quite mm. interesting about this is that this isn't particularly a philosophical thing. <laughs> and uh, I, although people like to say the philosophers have... Um, general critical thinking skills and so forth. I'm not always convinced that, you know, I, I think this kind of statistical literacy isn't something you necessarily get from doing doing philosophy. You have to kind of have a broader interest in, in, in good reasoning. Well, I expected today's um, conversation because I've been reading uh, Life a User's Manual, which I suppose is an intro to philosophy in general, but an intro to, to you as well. Uh, and your and your work and it's so diverse and it's it's very accessible for someone like me to sort of get into and get to grips with these things so i expected this conversation to sort of bounce backwards and forwards and be very casual it also might um just um fail at some point because i'm <laughs> using some some weird um not, not because of the co- the content of the conversation but because of the wi-fi that i have so if it does please do just i was just thinking i haven't said that if you just stay in this zoom call and i'll, I'll okay. get it working again and pop pop back in um but but yeah, it's it's okay. I mean, it's fine to go back. With, I think people like those podcasts when they're quite casual. And the first podcasts I did, the first episodes, I used to really edit them as if it were for TV or something, uh, like every little tiny bit. And then as it's gone on, I've realized people quite like the rambly stuff. Um, so, wait, are you still there? Oh. <laughs> Shit on it. 
That's quite funny. The moment is working fine until you mentioned there's a Wi-Fi problem and then it went That's down. That's so funny. I can't believe that happened right then. I thought it must be like a joke that the internet was playing on me. I think it is. I think it's actually... Um, that's proof we're living in a simulation, isn't it? I think that the, the, there's some <laughs> actual, so some point having fun, doing malicious little hacks every now and again. I don't believe that, by the way, but I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> I don't know a philosopher. Most people don't know somebody who is, by profession, a philosopher, right? And you write in the book um, about, I think it was... Uh, Nietzsche and and Kierkegaard being successes because they got to write for a living, which is, I guess, what you get to do. Um, yeah. What's it like? What's what's the deal? <laughs> Writing for a living. Yeah, um, and being a philosopher, like a thinker. Yeah, I don't know. The thing is, the thing about being a philosopher is that it's. Um, I mean, there are some people who 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 would sniff at that. You know, it's quite interesting. You know, who gets to be called a philosopher in a different different cultures. In the sort of Anglo-American world, the academics do feel they own it. And you know, I've come across many people, not necessarily talking about me, but sometimes talking about me or other people, saying, well, well, he or she's not a philosopher because they're not an academic philosopher. Either they're an academic in another discipline or they're not an academic. And they're very quite proprietorial about it. And, that's, and it's quite weird as well that philosophers should think like that. And not realise how how socially constructed that category is. So, for example, I'm half Italian, and in Italy, it's not like that at all. If you're a, a philosophy professor, you're a philosophy professor, right? A philosopher to be a philosopher uh, indicates a certain kind of you get that accreditation by having published certain things. So, um, they they distinguish between being a philosophy professor or philosophy instructor and being a philosopher. So. You know what? 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 What does it mean? So, being a philosopher, I don't know what that means. I mean, basically, I, 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 I kind of think that primarily, I like to think I'm primarily a, a, a writer, but I guess that's not entirely true. I'm a, I suppose, writer, thinker. Um, it's I like. I feel incredibly privileged to do to do what I do. To be honest, I, I couldn't have imagined this was a possible path in life when I was younger. Um, and I, and in fact, I kind of, you know, I never had a master plan to get here either. It was kind of, uh, a series of fortuitous steps, you know, uh, the, I took the next step and the next step and the next step and I ended up, um, here, but it, it, it is a tremendous privilege. And I, and I do, I do think, you know, compared to being an academic, I am freed from a lot of the things that academics have to do. So, I mean, for example, a lot of people sometimes say with, I think, barely disguised contempt that I, I seem to publish a lot of books, uh, meaning that, you know, you, you knock them off a bit, don't you? And, I've, <laughs> and that's not true. The point is, it's my full-time job, whereas um, most people writing, it's not their full-time job, actually. They're, they're, if they're academics, they're doing a lot of teaching and lecturing and writing research papers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, you know, even other people are doing lots of other things. So... Uh, to be able to, to to focus as much of my time as I can uh, do and not be distracted by, you know, choosing a new sink uh, for the kitchen uh, is, 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 is very, very lucky. It's a cool job. And if you're out with your friends or family and there's like a moral quandary, do people go, Julian, come on, what do we do? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah well, well, no, but I mean, they do, they do kind of, I don't know. They often expect you to have thought about it. But I think most people are a little bit kind of, perhaps it's to do with the country we live in. I think most people are actually a little bit kind of almost mocking of, 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 of philosophy. You know, they, they kind of, uh, oh, well, you know, that's for the philosophers, isn't it? Ha, 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 <laughs> you know. And I think a lot of people have almost like a pride in, in not being too too philosophical about things. But the other thing is, you know, that one of the things I think is most interesting about these kind of issues is that, you know, no one ever really does or can, not well, no one, very few people really do, do that thing of saying, well, I don't know, I'm not an expert, I'm not a philosopher, let's ask a moral philosopher. And then they tell me what I should do. And they say, okay, I'll do it. They don't, you know, we can't, in the end, we always end up, this is a strange thing that we always end up trusting our own judgment, even when we know we're not experts in it. And, and that's the kind of thing where we kind of have to think for ourselves. You're always told, think for yourself, think for yourself. But in fact, we always think for ourselves the, 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 when we, we say think for yourselves, I think what we're really doing is saying two things. One is recognize the fact that you are thinking for yourself. Don't pretend you're simply following someone's advice because 
you know, this is the old Jean Paul Sartre type thing. When you when you follow someone's advice, you have chosen to follow that person's advice rather than someone else's. So there's some thinking and responsibility behind that. But the second thing is to say, look, you are already thinking for yourself, so do it properly. You know, don't do it sloppily, quickly, in a hurry, whatever. Take a bit of time to do it properly. And I think that's that's um, an important thing too. Reminds me of when people ask for advice, for example, on relationships. You know, they say, what should I do about this girl or something? And like, you know that whatever you say is not going to influence anything mm. they do. They're going to do, they like that girl or they don't, you know? Yeah, that's true. It's very interesting this because uh, I, I was just um, listening to a little podcast the other day from a philosopher. I'm going to get her, her name on, Katerina de Tula. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm always bad with names. Italian, something Italian as well. No, she's, it's very interesting. Brazilian, Dutch, a, a real ah. sort of a cosmopolitan person. Catherine Dulas or something. Anyway, it'll come to me later. Or it won't. But um, she's written quite a, a, what sounds like a very interesting book. And one thing she's talking about is that the, the whole thing about logic and reason and argument her, her argument is that if you look not just in the Western tradition, but in other traditions as well, it really emerges out of this dialogical re- reasoning. In other words, talking and thinking with others. So you kind of see in the Socratic dialogues, there's, there's characters there sort of dramatizing the way these things really work. And a lot of recent work in psychology, there's this idea of social cognition, which uh, Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber have um promoted a great deal very interesting book the enigma of reason well worth worth reading mm. and they're arguing that again you know a lot of a lot of psychology in recent years the take home message people have is how bad people are at reasoning because you give them these basic logic tests and they fail and they don't understand basic probabilities etc cetera, etc cetera. but they're saying that people fail in those kind of text tests because they're tests which first of all get you to they, they're first of all they're very abstract they're not related to particular situations and secondly you're asked to do it all by yourself But when human beings think together, particularly about things that matter, actually, we're pretty good. And there's a lot of evidence that that's kind Mm. of um, true. So how did this relate to your initial question? I've now forgotten the question that this started with. Uh, Um, About about whether people actually listen to one another's advice. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I think I'm being... Am I being shouted at? I hope so. (laughs) No, I don't think it's me. I think it's somebody else. Um... Someone doing work, by the way, rather than just a random person uh, ah, shouting right. at me. I don't yeah, often no. get shouted at for no for no reason. It would have been an exciting turn of events. Yeah. So whether we really listen to each other, I think that what you're saying about relationship advice and all that kind of stuff is, well, you know, we know generally speaking, um, it doesn't work very well to basically tell people what they ought to do. It just doesn't really work. Um, does it work, though, if you have a conversation in which you are genuinely able to, to give the person the space to to you know work through and think about with you as the kind of foil the issues there well often that kind of thing does lead to to certain changes you know um so i I think part of the problem is that a lot of us and particularly i think i have this weakness myself i think that i kind of with this kind of philosophical training and temperament and background um i often approach a discussion as though it's simply a question of let's get clear on you know the facts of the arguments and pros and cons and bish bash box that's the conclusion let's get on with it and and that's a very very poor strategy um when it's involved with 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 affecting people's behavior or helping them to think it through you know you've got to not be the advice giver you've got to be the the participant in a in a kind of uh discussion Mm. and i think that's quite important in 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 philosophy in general actually Oh, uh, it must be hard because a, a, a lot of people are emotional and, and emotion can cloud logic in many respects and you've got to sort of be on their emotional wavelength as well, right? Yeah, that's true. Although, again, I think it's the, the sort of distinction between emotion and reason can be uh, overstated and, 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 and made more absolute than it is. I mean, the point is that uh, there are lots of things we do in life where the emotion is an integral component. It's not blinding us or distorting us it's part of it i mean i would even say that that's true of ethics actually um there are some people historically and now who believe that ethics is at root a purely rational thing it's about you know best consequences or there's some abstract rule but if you're if you're like me uh, think of ethics more as like david hume did or even aristotle did it's about our human interactions how we manage our human interactions and, and a key element of that is what we 
tend to now call it empathy or or moral sympathy, seeing things from other people's points of view. So, you know, in order to do any sort of moral reasoning, you've actually got to connect with that emotion too. You, you know, it's not something you can approach in a purely abstract way. So it's often more of a case that people are not attending sufficiently to the role the emotional dimension has in the decision-making process, rather than, um, you know, there being this fundamental conflict between thinking things through rationally and how we feel about it. Because that is a little bit a part of the sort of culture wars going on at the moment. You sort of get one camp who seem to be responding uh, quite emotionally and you get another camp going, rational, everything, you're not being rational. And then I I guess it's it's about uh, the middle ground, which I suppose a philosopher often seems to find them so i mean especially if i your your book uh, you know life a user's manual uh you you sort of show one argument and then the other and sort of sort of tend to settle in in the middle is is that the safe space a lot of the time well yeah i mean going back a bit though i think the culture wars thing i don't think it'd be right to to characterize it as one side being emotional and one side being rational i think that's the way it often seems but it probably seems that way to both sides to be honest with you I think a lot of people who perhaps to you and I uh, are on the wrong side of certain debates believe they're being perfectly rational and evidence-based. I mean, again, go back to this thing about, you know, uh, the reaction against a lot of what's happened to do with female equality and everything. Uh, the people on the other side of that debate think this is just flying in the face of evidence. They'll they'll quote your Jordan Peterson saying, look, the studies have shown, you know, that women are actually less happy when you give them all this equality and liberty. They are actually much happier when they're uh, in their homemaker role and are not also given the added burden of having to sort of do things like run countries or, or businesses, you know. And for them, that's evidence, that's facts. And the emotions of the other side, it's us, it's us lot who are being emotional, who are so emotionally committed to our bogus ideas of equality that we can't see that the plain truth in front of our eyes and 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 the, the problem is there is an element of truth in that in the sense that I, I think they're wrong on that issue and other issues but they are kind of right though the the, the the people who sort of to tell themselves no no I'm, I'm just being rational about this I, there's nothing there's nothing else going on other than pure reason that's that's never true there are emotions involved on, on both sides the thing about the, the the middle thing it's interesting you say that the approach we take in the book. So I wrote this with with Antonio, my my, my partner, um, Antonio Mercado, and it's not necessarily being in the middle, um, but I think it's, it's often the case, almost always the case, that um, if there is an issue where there seem to be two seemingly diametrically opposed kind of responses, the, the at, which don't seem to be able to be. Uh, entirely reconciled is because there's kind of elements of truth in both and and it's, it's, it's doing justice to both sides now it's not necessarily a case of being in the middle but it is a way of bringing that kind of balance so because we're talking about politics we may as well give this as an example you know i i where do i where am i in the political spectrum you know i'm a fairly kind of social democrat really in that european sense i think but you know the point is this: it's not that that's because the the ideal point is between two extremes. It's because uh, coming from the left, there is a lot of very true stuff about um, the fundamental unfairness of economic inequality, uh, about questioning people's right to ownership of things like land and so forth. There's a lot which is really really true there. But the, but you have to acknowledge, you know, the, the, on the conservative side, it's just not. To say it's just pure defence of the status quo and the powerful is 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 not being sufficiently understanding of it. And there is a the truth in conservatism, which you, comes back in people like Burke, is that uh, we ought to be very cautious about believing that we can sort of design society on a blank sheet of paper, and that society is this rather delicately evolving ecosystem which you kind of meddle with kind of at your peril. You have to be very cautious. Now, the point is, I think that's all true. The problem for me is that a lot of traditional conservatives use that as an excuse to ref- to not make reforms that need to make be reformed, right? Yeah. But unless you bear that in mind, you end up with naive utopian schemes from the left, which, which aren't going to work and which do undermine the fabric of society. So so find the balance there. It's not just it's a it's all about it's not about meeting in the middle. It's about doing justice to two different sets of considerations, which if you followed one alone would take you to a an extreme path. 
It sounds um, a lot like Daniel Finkelstein, who was on, on this podcast. Do you know of him? I He's, do know of him. I haven't hmm, read a lot he, of his stuff, I have to confess. Oh, he just had a, a book out called Everything in Moderation, yeah. and he's a conservative uh, a lord as well, but he's very uh, progressive conservative. Um, and Because he grew up with parents, uh, I think his father was in a, a, a Soviet labor camp, and his mother was in a, a Nazi concentration camp. So he sort of saw the perils of thinking one too far one way or the other. I think, um, I mean... <laughs> Is that the the left seems to often be thinking, um, often seems to be trying to be righteous, but we've seen many times, I guess, in the 1900s where that led to a lot of death and 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 stuff like that. You know, particularly uh, sort of in the USSR and 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 China, sort of murdering uh, wealthy farmers and stuff. Which, you know, it. Is that like what we were saying before, that sort of 30% of people who are sort of trying to show their virtues are actually maybe quite bitter sometimes? I, I think that generally speaking, it's a dangerous thing to be too convinced you're on the side of virtue. And that's difficult because, of course, a lot of good things in the world have been done by people who have a very strong moral vision about making the world a better place. So this is actually quite difficult. But I think what tends to happen here is that the people who have that sense of virtue and goodness in the right way uh, don't tend to be ideological, right? They, 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 it's, it's more about decency and goodness. So people like, you know, going to do Médecins Sans Frontières or uh, the people who, who are heroic in dreadful situations such as through the Holocaust and saving people, there's not really an ideology there, that, but they are, they are driven by compassion and, and kindness and consideration for others. When your conviction of righteousness is attached to an ideological position, I, I just think it, 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 well, it's dangerous. I mean, the, the historical precedents kind of show that. And, and not just politically, you know, re religiously. I mean, religion is not the root of all evil, uh, but a lot of awful things have been done in the name of religion precisely because people believe they're on the side of God, you know. I mean, people point to Islamicists today who are uh, doing awful things in the name of Allah. Uh, but the, the truth that that you don't have to go back far in history to see people doing awful things in the name of the, the Christian God, too. Um, so, and 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 why is that? Well, it's just because. In general, I think that excessive certainty is always dangerous, to be honest. One, one's got to maintain this attitude of, one's got to hold one's beliefs lightly, even when one's quite convinced about them. So it's a bit of a balancing act. So if we take the idea of, of, of I mean, I'd say I'm an atheist. And so we say, oh, you can't be an atheist. That's far too dogmatic. And I say, well, no, it's not dogmatic in the sense that I don't, I could be wrong, right? I could be wrong. But, <laughs> um, I, at the moment, the balance of evidence and argument seems pretty strong. So I'm, I'm convinced this is right, but I'm not convinced in that way that I'm dogmatically attached to that view. And I'm simply going to... And, and, and not only that, I, I, I'm, it doesn't follow from that, that therefore, because this is the right view, I have the moral authority to impose what follows from that on other people, right? And that's the other element of dogmatism. So, yeah, it's that, that excessive zeal of, of dogmatic certainty is, is, is always dangerous, even when on paper, no, especially when on paper, the, the, the virtues seem really, really good and kind. What could be, what could be more wonderful than, than the aspiration to uh, live as your creator intended you to do? Especially if your creator hates all the same people you do. <laughs> well, yes, yeah, yeah. But maybe, yeah, there's... And cause and effect can go in different ways there, can't it? I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, yeah. Some you can end up hating people because, yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's fantastic that a lot of for for a lot of you know religious homophobic people that their god happens to also hate homosexuality. So great coincidence yeah. there, but yes, cause and effect, of course. Yeah, huge coincidence. Even though, even though, even though, bizarrely, you know, there's there's, there's no sign at all Jesus hates homosexuals at all. In fact, he didn't have anything to say about homosexuals. Not a single thing about homosexuals. Is there not? <laughs> no, no, nothing, nothing, nothing about homosexuality. Jesus said nothing about homosexuality, and he said very little about sexual morality as well. So, um, the one time he got involved with a, with a, I mean, he did, he did, he kind of, Jesus 
did uh, was very much against divorce, actually, funnily enough. Uh, very explicit about that. Um, but he certainly wasn't for sort of the stoning of divorces or anything like that. So the one time we got involved with an individual caught up in sexual immorality was the, the famous story, The Woman Taken in Adultery, as it is called. And of course, what he did there was he didn't, he didn't, he made it clear he thought she had done wrong because he says at the end, go and sin no more. But he stops people punishing her by saying, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. So um, even if you take the leap, even if you were to somehow convince yourself that of course Jesus was against homosexuality, which is far from whatever, his attitude towards hom homosexuals would have been the kind, compassionate attitude he took towards uh, the adulterer. Adulterous. So, you know, when you see these people outside, you know, with these banners saying God hates fags, I mean, where on earth do they get that from? Are you thinking of the Westboro Baptist Church? Uh, and, and, and people of their ilk, yeah, yeah. I mean, you yeah, know, they're the most extreme and most vicious. But a lot of people, you know, probably a lot of people wouldn't say God hates fags. They'd probably say God loves fags, but he hates their faggotry or whatever it would be. Um, no, you know, no evidence of that. You sounded like uh, Gramps Phelps, the, the, the head of that, that, <laughs> that church there. We had his son. Um, I, he was, I always say we as if I've got like a whole set. It's the royal re. It's the, the royal re is, is very important. I, I had his, his uh, son, Nate, was on this, was on this podcast. As a philosopher, right, you draw on sort of Confucius and Aristotle and all these people. Do you imagine that are they sort of actual, definitely real people? Can you imagine them sort of walking around, <laughs> going to the toilet, uh, going shopping, like, or are they sort of like a, a, a mythical mix of people? Uh, I, th I think that they are. Those two are both historical people. I think that's true. So I don't think we need to doubt the historical. Well, Aristotle certainly was. I think Confucius. Almost certainly was. But of course, we know so little about them. You know, I mean, um, yeah, we know so little about them. But yeah, they would have been real people going around, going to the toilet, eating and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I think something like Aristotle, that's even more more sort of evident. I think that kind of comes through. He's a very down-to-earth philosopher who kind of avoided saying a lot of the silly things that other philosophers have said when they allow themselves to believe that essentially we're, we're just brain, minds, who happen to be uh, trapped in these bodies, and it doesn't really matter. Um, this thing about, you know, people often assume that the philosophical attitude, for example, is to think that death should mean nothing to us. And they often quote Epicurus on this or certain Stoics, you know, because we, we're not bothered by the fact we didn't exist before. We shouldn't be bothered by the fact we don't exist in the future. Just get over it. Death is nothing. Uh, Aristotle doesn't buy that at all. Um, he says that actually the, the, good, the good person, the fully good person, actually is one who, who most fully appreciates uh, life and what it has to offer and therefore is in a sense the most sad at the thought that it will end. So he doesn't, you know, he doesn't think one should sort of like rail against the inevitable and sort of get too distressed, but, but feeling not happy about it is, is, is natural and normal. And similarly, he's so taking a swipe at Plato when he says this, I think, this idea that, there's this idea that the perfectly virtuous person, because they're so self-sufficient in their own mind, is totally indifferent to what goes on physically. And therefore, you know, you could be, no matter no matter how much your physical situation is awful, you could still be happy because you can rise above it. And he just says at some point, you know, the idea that a person on the rack could be happy is just an absurdity. And he's, he's, he's right. So I think with, with Aristotle, he's very down to earth and you, you can imagine him as a as a, as a real fully rounded human being. I think you imagine Socrates hmm. being an annoying little bugger, actually. Oh, really? Uh, he just likes to pick fights and tell you you're wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, the platonic dialogues, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in them. I don't want to knock, knock it too much, but it's called dialogues, but they're not really. They're Socrates going around showing people that they can't really back up what they say they think and that they don't <laughs> know anything. And he doesn't put positive answers in their place either. So he leaves you sort of in this situation of, well, you know. <laughs> uh, but, you know, a little, a little bit annoying. But, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Don't get me wrong. But it's, uh, it, it, I, I, I think I'd, you'd probably rather have a cup of tea with Aristotle than Plato, I think. Were they, like, writing stuff down on, like, like papyrus or something? Yeah, it's interesting. In the case of, well, Socrates didn't write anything down. Plato did. Um, so Plato's dialogues feature Socrates as a character and his big scholarly debate about to what extent 
Plato Socrates is the historical Socrates and uh, the general answer is not exactly some of the earlier ones were probably more close to Socrates than the later ones etc etc Aristotle did write things down unfortunately we lost most of them and most of what we now see as the, the works of Aristotle are actually kind of like lecture notes literally you know so he was writing them down but they weren't written down as kind of fully developed treaties a lot of the time so um yeah i mean we await the day when some amazing archaeological find pulls out um some of these lost lost works that would be quite amazing in particular interestingly enough and i read a very very interesting essay on this many years ago now um and by another julian whose surname i can't remember um, you can Google it. It's in the Prospect Archive. And it points out the fact that, you know, we, we've got Aristotle's treatise on tragedy, well, writings on tragedy. We don't have his works on comedy. Uh, Aristotle almost certainly did write about comedy. And the, the idea of this rather lovely essay is that, you know, tr tragedy has this kind of elevated status in culture, whereas comedy is seen as something lesser and inferior. And his idea is that actually that's probably not true. Comedy is as, as important and as interesting and as philosophical as tragedy. And, uh, you know, may, maybe one of the reasons why it doesn't have the same status is that one of the canonical thinkers, we have, we know what they thought about tragedy. We don't know what they thought about comedy. It's quite an interesting hypothesis. Julian Goff, I think it was. I guess there's also a snobbishness, isn't there? That tra tra even today, tragedy is sort of very serious. Uh, comedy is is a bit silly, so we shouldn't take it as seriously. Yeah, but tragedies are very silly a lot of the time as well. You know, I mean, most operas are ridiculous, in, you know, in a, <laughs> and and the, the, Shakespeare's tragedies they end in I mean, you know the, the number of bodies and the, how long they take to die as well. You know, <laughs> I am dying. I don't get on with it for goodness sake. Um, so I mean, tragedies are often ridiculous in a different way. Um, I, I think comedy is very, very uh, philosophically rich. Um, I've done a couple of long talks on I did one on the Simpsons and, and philosophy which is and one on Monty Python and with Monty Python I seriously in Monty Python I think you get in a very very concise form a kind of Anglo-Saxon version of existentialism so when it comes through the French thinkers it's all quite heavy and serious and you know Gitan and Black Polonex and that, that kind of th fits the mood it's all quite heavy the same basic ideas, I think, come through uh, Monty, Monty Python, but with that kind of completely different response to it. So in other words, yes, life is absurd. Life is ridiculous. It's without ultimate meaning. And the re best response to that is a kind of ironic laughter. And that, that's, that's the way you deal with it. And in fact, other things mm. as well with Monty Python. If you think, I mean, a lot of the Python TV was very hit and miss, wasn't it? As, as, a, as, as a lot of things yeah. were. Uh, the Holy Grail and, and Life of Brian were both absolutely brilliant. And it, what's interesting about both of those is they, they both, um, in a way, prefigure that, you know, the, the best kind of postmodern thought. So in postmodern thinking, part of the big idea there was that the death of the grand narratives or the meta-narratives, as sort of Leotard put it. So the idea here is that um, until recently, we've society's always had some belief in some sort of gl global big narrative which explains our our destiny as a nation you know the manifest destiny in the united states of america or you know the creation and the resurrection and life to come in in whatever or the march of history the sort of marxist march of history this is inevitable progression from uh you know the 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 you know, the proletariat would rise up and would create all these grand narratives these o these overarching theories which explain everything give a story and and one of the sort of things about postmodernism is that we've no, we're no longer able to believe in those things anymore. They've all become incredible. And the Holy Grail mm. and, and Python are sort of doing that in a very comic way. They're completely puncturing. They're showing the absolute absurdity in believing these grand overarching theories, such as there being a messiah or yeah, these, these great destinies. And I think they do it so well. It's so well. I think very, very serious stuff. Seriously funny. Yeah, and well, they touch on... on death as well and you mentioned death earlier and I was just you know what that's that's one of the topics in your book as well what what can we do to is is the answer to just not think about it no I don't think so I don't think so I think um I think well, one of the things worth saying here is that with all this kind of philosophy as it relates to living a good life it is this classic thing that there's a difference between understanding it 
and being able to, to live it, you know. And a lot of people find this. I mean, the most banal example of this perhaps is uh, when people often say when they get a serious illness, like it came as a complete shock, like I never thought it would happen to me. And obviously, if you push them, push them on that, yeah, at some intellectual level, they knew people get ill. People, It can happen to anyone. They knew that intellectually, but it hadn't really sunk in. So when it does happen to them, it's a shock, right? Similarly, the loss of your parents. Now, I actually think maybe I'm a bit weird because I actually have found in my life that when such things have happened, I haven't been shocked. I have thought, well, you know, of course, it's going to happen at some point. But but that doesn't mean I'm always good, uh, as it were, absorbing and living what I understand intellectually. And I think that when it comes to, like, coming to terms with your mortality and the inevitability of death, it's a kind of a, a constant kind of work in progress. And I think the, 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 the thing I aspire... What I aspire to is... A, that kind of understanding which I think's most actually captured best in kind of Japanese thought. And is and in Japanese thought, philosophy, aesthetics, art, they're all actually more more interconnected. But there were a lot of these sort of like concepts we've got in in, in from Japan, like mono no ware, which is like the um the pathos of things is a translation. This idea that when you really fully appreciate anything in life, there is always the combination of the bitter and the sweet. So in Japan, the, the major festival is Hanami, which is the, the cherry blossom season. And I think, you know, what a, what a brilliant festival, much more meaningful than, than Christmas has become in, in here. And the whole point of that is you picnic under the cherry blossom because the cherry blossom comes and it's beautiful. But the whole point is it's temporary, it doesn't last first big storm it's all blown off and it and it's gone and the appreciation of the cherry blossom is is about trying to sort of combine that this is wonderful this is beautiful but it will pass and therefore there's an element of sadness there too so i kind of think that you i i think it's complete nonsense to think that one should um accommodate oneself to death by simply becoming indifferent about it and not caring at the same time one shouldn't live in in fear of it and in dread of it, rather to cultivate this appreciation in which you accept things are going to come to an end. That's part of their beauty, but that doesn't mean there isn't any sadness there. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the kind of, thing. and I think that that gives you, if you can really live that, I think it does give you that kind of heightened appreciation. I mean, people talk a lot about mindfulness. And I think that it's, it's a term which is used in many, many, many different forms, but I think sometimes it's kind of abused. And some people think what mindfulness means is being in the moment in, in a pure and simple way, like a cat is or a dog is. And I think that's really odd, actually. Why should we aspire to be like a cat or a dog? <laughs> we're humans, right? What makes us humans is that we're, ne we're not entirely in the moment, we are conscious of our biographies and we're conscious of the future. So the kind of mindfulness I think we should be cultivating isn't where we're trying to achieve, we're trying to become less than human by becoming only aware of the moment. It's that being aware of the moment precisely as something which is between the past and the future, which won't last forever, and appreciating it in that way. So it's appreciating the moment in that fully human way, not in the cat-dog way, which is fine for mm. a cat or a dog. I've got a very nice cat who's in the moment a lot of the time, but I don't want to be like him. Yeah, I find that really uh, interesting, actually, because it's actually something I was going to ask you about mindfulness and stuff like that, because I think it must be all right for some people because they seem to get a lot of joy out of, of that thing, of just that, you know, or let, let all thoughts go pass by like a cloud. And I've tried that, and a lot of us have tried that, and I think for some people it just doesn't work at all. And I think I quite like... I enjoy worrying. Does that make any sense? I, I enjoy <laughs> thinking and and going. Oh, what's going to be next? And what? And it is stressful, but it's. I quite like it. Does, what? Do you yeah, know what I mean? I, yeah. I do know what you mean, and I think there's um, perhaps we can go quite as far as that. But I think there's something to that. I, I don't know what you. Do we, what, what do you make of this? I, over the years, I occasionally do come across people who have this kind of who tell you um, that they've. Their, through their kind of practice, um, 
they have no ego, for example, in a very proud way, which I think is very interesting. <laughs> uh, and and about this acceptance, about tranquility and all this stuff. What I find is I find those people react in ways which are, for, for people who, who think they're above all things, they, they seem to be quite fragile. They don't, they don't like to sort of like hear about problems and difficulties or that you might disagree with them or this may not be right. It seems to me that in order to sort of live in this sort of bubble of perfect tranquility, you've got to cut yourself off from a lot of things, to be honest. And I, so I, I, I do agree. I think part of being human is that we're involved in things which create anxiety and upset and insecurity. I mean, obviously, relationships are one of the key things of that. I mean, this is why I'm not into the Stoics at all, by the way. And, and uh, I, I don't want to sort of create a reputation as being a complete enemy of it. it all, but it always comes up. It's in the ether. It's in the ether at the moment. It's Stoicism. There's a lot of books and stuff about it. But a lot of people who are advocating Stoicism are really advocating watered-down Stoicism, which might be fine. But fully-blown Stoicism really says, look, don't get attached to anything. You know, um, if you... So this is paraphrasing actual Stoic texts. If you drop a jug, just say it is just a jug. Don't worry about that. If you if you if you if you lose your children or your wife, say it is just a wife. It is just a child. That doesn't matter. You know. And come on, no. You know it's it's appropriate to be distraught and upset. If you're going to do something meaningful, if you're going to try and do a podcast series, which in the grand scheme of things, and can we come back to the grand scheme of things in a minute, mm. may not matter. But nonetheless, you know, part of having a meaningful life is to be engaged in projects. If you're going to be properly engaged with them, you're going to care about them and you are going to be bothered if, if it goes badly and you're going to be pleased if it goes well. So, sure, we get too caught up in things that don't matter. We, we attribute too much value to things we shouldn't attribute to true. But in order to live a rich and engaged life, I think you're going to be open to uh, a lot of these so-called negative emotions. And mm. so I think the idea you should somehow try and make them your enemy is not true. Now... A quick response on that, though. A lot of people who advocate mindfulness would say that's not what mindfulness is about. Mindfulness is about accepting those negative emotions, but simply not amplifying them or not endorsing them. And there's some there's some benefit in that. But again, you know, um, sometimes we do want to partly endorse them, you know, not just yeah. notice them, but to, 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 to actually endorse them. So if I'm upset because um, some some project that matters to me has gone very badly... I don't think it's appropriate it's just to say, I'm just going to notice that negative feeling. I don't have to endorse it. I think recognising the fact that I do endorse it as being appropriate in some way is important for maintaining certain values. But sorry, I'm, yeah. free, I'm, I'm going on a bit, but the grand scheme of no. things is my, my obsession of the last four, uh, 48 hours is, is precisely this, because I think that being told things don't matter in the grand scheme of things is completely useless. What, what a silly thought. You know, nothing matters in the grand scheme of things. So yeah. how's that supposed to help? You know, it, I may as well kill myself because my life doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. I think a more important thing, what we should be saying to each other is, do you know what? In the small scheme of things, that doesn't <laughs> matter. Because uh, we often, our problem is, is not often... Uh, look, I don't think most people's problem is that they, they think what's happening to them matters in the grand scheme of things. We're not that egocentric. A few people are. But in the small scheme of things, we think things matter. And in the small scheme of things, a lot of things don't matter as much as, the, as we think they do. So, you know, look, we're getting work done in, in, in the house. Lucky us, we're having work done in the house. And things go wrong. The point here is at the moment at which, you know, you realise you've got to pull something out and it's going to cost an extra couple of hundred quid and all that kind of stuff. You, know, you can get on top of you and think, ah, oh, that's awful. You don't say in the grand scheme of things it doesn't matter. In the grand scheme of things, we don't need a bloody kitchen. Let's just die. <laughs> it, the point is, the, remind, the useful reminder is it doesn't matter in the small scheme of things because actually, even within a few days' time, the hassle will be over. The, the difference to how your kitchen is going to function is going to be marginal. And uh, on your deathbed, the extra cost isn't going to mean the difference between you having a, a difficult or an easy life financially. Yeah. So it yeah. doesn't matter in the small scheme of things. I suppose pe people might be saying the, the grand scheme of their life, you know, but... but Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah okay. Well, that, that's true as well. It, it, but in that case, there are, there are lots of other things one, one should think to try and put things in, in perspective. Uh, but every now and again, something happens which, you know, uh, is, is really significant. Yeah, and sometimes things really do, do matter. Obviously, bereavement yeah. is one of the most obvious things, you know. If you lose someone very close to you, 
there's no point pretending that that isn't anything other than, than, a, than a really, really bad thing. And then the only consolations you have are, are the things that you don't need. Yeah, you, know, you don't really need philosophy to tell you these things, do you? Um, death comes to us all. Sometimes it comes to some people earlier than than, it sh- than we think it kind of should. But there's no should to any of this, you know. Um if someone's had a good life and you're able to enjoy it, then, you know, you have to just treasure that and not mm. think about how it could have been even even better. Would you give up your life for someone else's? In, in the right circumstances, yes. And for the right person in the right circumstances, I think so. I mean, I might be too cowardly to do it, right? So I don't know until I'm tested. But I don't, I don't see why not. Um, I, I value my life, but it's not the most Im- important thing. Um, it is quite interesting when you when you come across people who who have put their own lives at risk for other people. Because uh, I, I, I talked about this in my book on free will, freedom regained, because we kind of really admire this as a choice. But a lot of the time in those situations, people don't perceive it as a choice. The reason they do it is because they feel it would somehow be impossible to carry on living having made the alternative choice, you know. So if you're a parent, for example, you know, and you risk your own life to save your child, I'm not a parent myself, but, you know, in a sense that that doesn't even feel like a choice because <laughs> you, you couldn't you couldn't live with yourself if you simply stood by and saw your your, your child die. And uh, Paul, Rusesa, Paul Rusesa Begina, who was the Rwandan hotel manager who's now been imprisoned in Rwanda, actually, um, very interesting story. You know, he saved lots of people during the massacre. Um, there's a certain amount of attempts to discredit him. Um, but as far as I can tell, he hasn't been discredited. He, he was never a saint. He was always a, a flawed human being. But nevertheless, he did genuinely save people, I think. And he says the same thing. He felt he, he, he had the opportunity to leave and to save himself and not put himself at risk. But he he expressed it that he, he, he couldn't do that. He could not do that because if he did it, he couldn't live with himself, you know. And I think in in in, in those situations, and maybe there were certain causes as well. I don't know, you know. I mean, if I was in a situation whereby I could achieve a great good at the sacrifice of my own life, I might be tempted to think, well, you know, I've had a good life. Goodbye. Wow, I'd probably be a coward. I, I say that, but I, but I have no idea, and I think that I've no, ev- I have no evidence at all that I'm a courageous person. I've, sh- I haven't been <laughs> forced to show any any courage in my own life. Um, in terms of, in terms of like courage towards putting myself at risk for other people, I don't think I've been tested on that. So I could be completely self deluded. So I think I'm quite relatively compared to the average person i like to think or maybe everyone likes to think this about themselves that i'm quite a selfless person that i would try i I think of others more i would i think more than other people do but i don't think i can ever envisage myself and maybe it's the sort of you know youth the folly of youth or whatever I'm, i'm 32 still and i don't have kids or anything like that i cannot imagine give it it almost makes no sense to me because once you once you're gone that's you're gone like for billions of years and you're gone sort of like for for what it doesn't make time doesn't even exist anymore it's not a thing anymore so i almost can't imagine the world and this is really narcissistic um but like without me in it because it ends for me do you know what i mean yeah yeah well it is true there's a sense when when a person dies a whole world dies with them their world dies with them that's true i i think that um and you're right age might have something to do with it as people get older they do tend to get a bit more kind of um uh, phlegmatic about you know well you know my time comes my time comes um, so 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 that's true but the the inability is you know that that basic coming to terms with the fact that there, that you will not live forever and there will your universe will come to an end I think it's one of those things whereby if you think about it enough you kind of get used to it <laughs> which but going back to Aristotle not that you're completely happy about it I'd much rather keep living. You know, I think we live in an amazing world. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a also a fucking awful world. If you're part of my French, I mean, there's so much awfulness going on, so much suffering, yeah. but there's also so much uh, beauty and, and and wonderfulness. And even even in the most challenging situations, you sometimes find these sort of moments of of joy hmm. and, and, yeah. and and things. So uh, I, I don't I don't want to. I don't want to go, but I will at some stage. And 
There's a wonderful David Hume, um, great, great philosopher, and he died slowly of an illness, so he got to kind of uh, reflect on this. And he was visited by Adam Smith shortly before his death, and he, he was told him how he had this imaginary dialogue with... Um, uh, what's his name? The guy who, the ferryman who carries people across the sticks. Right, yeah. And um, his name temporarily escapes me. And and he kind of imagines sort of like how he would sort of like argue with him that his time hasn't yet come. And how all, everything he said would be knocked back as sheer vanity, <laughs> right? So he'd say stuff like, you know, look, I still have important work to do. To which you'd be told, for goodness sake, you know, you spent 40 years writing this stuff. If people haven't sort of cottoned on yet, you don't think an extra 10 years is going to make a difference to you. And, and it's a whole series of things like this. And I, I kind of do feel the same. You know, if someone, if, if the if the Grim Reaper walked through the door, Monty Python style now, and says, wait, your number's up. I'd find it hard to argue that that wasn't fair enough. I've <laughs> been born into one of the wealthiest countries in the world at one of the most peaceful for it eras of the world as a a white man therefore with certain advantages and i've been able to do things uh, that you know i've been able to do things that in previous generations not even emperors could have done you know the ability to jump on a plane and yeah, I circumnavigate. I circumnavigated the world once in a plane, which was like you know, inconceivable for almost everyone for most of history. Could I really have any grounds to complain? So it's not that I'd want to go, but I'd think, fair enough. I've had a, I've had more than my share of this particular pie. Yeah, but but it's all relative, isn't it? Because you're comparing it to you know poverty in other parts of the world and people in the past. Uh, but if you were comparing yourself to a being that lived 10,000 years and with endless richesses or richness or whatever, luxuries, um, then you'd be like, oh, I've got the short end of the straw here. Yeah, well, the such things don't exist. But also, I don't think I could compare myself to them because that's mm. a, such a completely different form of existence, you know. I mean, there's also, I mean, again, there's something that comes through the philosophical sort of reading and, and work is that, a, a, a human-like creature which lived for, say, a thousand years would be very, very different. That would be a very, very different kind of life. You know, our, the, the the sort of normal lifespan and expectation and, and, and biological ageing, all these things shape what life is and what it means to us. It's really almost impossible to imagine what it would be like to live in a way in which those constraints were radically altered. It's not difficult to imagine living an extra 10 or 20 years or even perhaps 30 um, but once you start getting beyond that, you're having to change so much of what makes human life what it is that can anyone really imagine that? And there are people who have said, people who have you know, written that it'd actually be awful, it would be a kind of curse you know, to have to live so long and you'd want out. I'm, I'm not sure what the limit is before that would be the case. But, um, but you know, what, the comparisons, you know, pick your comparisons, true, but I think it's much... The, the most relevant comparison, I think, is to the vast majority of people who have lived and do live today rather than to hypothetical people. <laughs> yeah, the people I've just made up in my head. Yeah, yeah. I do think about living forever because I had a couple of people on the podcast who, who talk about, you know, how they can do that and with, with science and stuff. And yeah. it's all very, a bit far-fetched, but at least for now. But but they really believe quite strongly in it. It was guy Andrew Steele who came on mm. and he thinks, you know, by the time uh you know in 50 60 years they might they might have started to cure death at least long enough for more innovations to come about in the following years so that your life keeps getting extended yeah yeah no i know there are i mean aubrey de grey is another one he sort of like he believes that because he's got this idea of like uh, i can't remember what the phrase is something like immortality escape velocity almost kind of thing but the idea being that you don't have to sort of like have the elixir of eternal life to live forever in the sense that if, if say, in 10 years' time, we can extend life by 20 years, then that gives you an extra 20 years, in which time they might have developed the technology to extend it by a bit more. Do you see what I mean? So he, he thinks there are already people alive who will live forever barring some kind of horrible accident. Uh, it's easy to, to... Look, let's see. If it happens, let's, let's cross that bridge when it comes to it. But, you know, I think we have to live our lives on the assumption of... Uh, on the assumption that we are going to cop it and there's no point in and I, I kind of in some ways I admire this kind of ambition to 
extend life hugely. Uh, but a lot of these people end up saying that, you know, part of their work viewpoint is that it's an absolute tragedy and terrible human catastrophe that we don't live forever. And I think that's kind of weird. I can't, I can't sort of embrace any worldview which makes the fundamental nature of the world itself a kind of a, a moral catastrophe. Mm. I, c- I could. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay, I, I, as I said that, I was sure. am I sure about that? I'm not sure about that, but... Okay. I think in practice, in practice, you've got to live your life according to the way the world actually is. That's not a reason not to want to make it different if you can. But if you feel like it's in, it's it's intolerable, absolutely intolerable the way it is, and the and the way you're seeking to change it is so fundamentally different that it's unlikely it's going to happen. That's just a cocktail for uh, profound dissatisfaction. That conversation continues for 20 minutes in the bonus segment, so sign up on patreon.com slash andrewgold or Apple VIP area. We talk about Boris, consumerism, Tottenham, noise, and what he'd say to God. I sincerely hope that Julian's profound wisdom has helped a few of you through your days. It was an absolute pleasure to have him on the show. What a lovely guy. And he's quite smart too, isn't he? Follow him on Twitter. It's just his name, uh, Julian Bergini. I'm on Andrew Gold underscore OK uh, on Twitter and Instagram. Join me for the premiere of or premiere of this episode on the On the Edge with Andrew Gold YouTube channel at 6 p.m. UK time on the Monday that this came out. The vast majority of you are probably probably listening to this after that right so you've probably missed it but anyway if you do get them on time we can chat on the side but i'm going to try and do that most mondays at 6 p.m uk time uh thank you so much to my newest patron luke c i forgot to ask if i could read out your full name but if you'd like me to just let me know and i'll do it again next week nice chatting to you luke though and please everyone do sign up but also review the podcast it's a big help last week bbm in the uk left five stars on apple saying brilliant thought-provoking open-minded podcast i have been listening for the past year and love this podcast never a dull interview Andrew invites really interesting, smart, engaging guests who break down the most complex issues to keep me hooked throughout. Through lockdown and beyond, this has been amazing to connect with the wider world. Andrew's non-judgmental approach ensures a great flow to the conversation. Have recommended to friends and family alike. Oh, thank you, BBM. And I love that you've recommended it to friends and family. Uh, that's a huge help. And it sort of grows very naturally that way. And people people trust their friends, don't they? I, I'm more likely to listen to something if a friend tells me, oh, you've got to you gotta hear or watch this, than if I see an advert for it. Um, Jessica Saul on CastBox wrote, I would highly recommend this episode. And, and I, should, I should just add, I don't know what episode because CastBox won't tell me which one uh, Jessica was commenting on. I listened to it three times as the thoughts of the interviewee are so deep and world changing. Again, I don't know. I don't know which one it was, but I wonder if it was actually uh, Colin Stewart about astronomy last week. I think it's that. I think that's what Jessica's talking about. She continues, I also like Andrew's interviewing style, which adapts to each guest and is relaxed, even though the topics are extremely serious. One of the best podcast episodes ever made. Oh, oh, now I want to know what the, if you can get, if you can get in touch, I'd love to know which episode it was. I feel like I did know at one point somehow, and now I can't find out which one it was. I think it was Colin Stewart. That's a great episode because he was just so brilliant. And he talked all about that thing of, you know, your loved ones, in the past or future they're they're out there in space time uh, even if they are no longer in our timeline which is weird to get your head around but very beautiful to think about as well thank you jessica uh thank you bbm um really lovely messages and it really helps not just for the podcast statistics but also for my well-being to know this is actually going out into the ether and being heard and enjoyed by people it's it's a lovely feeling thank you all for listening Tune in next week for Chris Ryan of Tangentially Speaking Podcast. He's fascinating and will talk all about what's... Se- I'm just trying to think how to... Pre- <laughs> I'm thinking how to pronounce tangentially. I think that's what it is. As if, as in going on a tangent and speaking about all different kinds of things, which is very much how Chris Ryan's podcast is. You are sort of... It bounces around in, in quite a, a marvellous way, which is why it's so very popular. He's fascinating and will talk about what sex was like for cavemen and and the like and why we do the sexy things we do so that's next week and i'll i'll see you then